If I can invite you back to your chairs and to pick up a Bible, if you don't have one, there's some in the back you can use to follow along. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning, chapter 5. We're walking through this book as a church, and in addition to walking through Ephesians, uh, we are in the, the second part of a, a two-part message on the section in Ephesians 5 that talks about marriage, talks about wives and husbands. Um, in considering this passage, I, I, we just felt like there was, there was so much truth packed into it that trying to cram it all into one message would, would do a disservice to it and to us in terms of our benefit as a church. And so what we did was divide it into roughly and simplistically last week a focus on the theology of the passage and this week on the application of the passage. So <clears throat> if I can make an appeal... If you're a guest and this is your first time here, uh, let me encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. And if this passage seems unusually application-centered, that is intentionally the case. Uh, please don't assume that we always focus almost entirely on application. But we, we wanted to give a whole week to the rich theology that's included here and then a whole week on exploring what application does it have for us as Christians, those of us that are married, uh, how can we apply the truth of this passage? So let's read it again this morning, and then I'll remind us a little bit of what I said last week, and we'll jump back into it. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. As a reminder of the the three points, theological points that I made last week about Christ and the church, we see in this passage that, that marriage is intended by God to paint a picture of the relationship that Christ has with his bride, the people of God. And in order to accomplish that, Paul draws out three aspects of that divine relationships, namely these, the headship of Christ for the church, which means that Christ is our authority, our governing leader, and that the church gladly submits to him. Secondly, the love of Christ for the church means that Jesus laid down his life for his bride, willingly sacrificing his life and his rights as God the Son in order to redeem her. And he treats her with the same contrast, the same same type of, of nourishment and instinctive care that we take toward our own bodies. Contrasting this with the kind of Uh, selfishness that we might normally expect uh, from a human being, Jesus casts all of that aside and lays down his life for his bride. And finally, the unity of Christ with the church is the reminder that marriage points to the ultimate mystery of two becoming one, that of Christ becoming one with his church, such that marriage is not an end in and of itself, but anticipates the great unification between Jesus Christ and the people of God. The way we talked about this last week was that marriage paints a picture. As a reminder of the illustration I used, I, I mentioned that I was talking to my daughter who likes to paint, 
And I said she was trying to do a portrait painting of someone, a family member at one point, and she was looking at this person, and she said to me later, you know, Daddy, uh, when you're trying to paint someone, you have to look closely, and you notice things when you look closely that you don't notice any other way. And I left it there. I didn't want to know what she noticed when she looked closely, but the point was that's true. When you're trying to paint a portrait, you have to look closely. So I think the primary application of this passage to Christians is look closely at Jesus and his relationship to the church. Look closely at the gospel because you're not going to be able to paint an effective picture unless you're looking closely at the model you're supposed to be imitating in what you draw and how you think about marriage and how you act if you're a husband towards your wife or a wife towards your husband. But it's also true that we have to examine what we are painting and see whether what we are painting matches the original. We look at the original, we gaze at the original, we consider the original. That's what we did last week. We also have to look at what we're painting. Our our eyes have to revert And look at him, that's our primary focus, but then also revert and say, is what I'm painting in my personal view about marriage or my marriage relationship itself, is it in keeping with that original? Does my marriage, or if you're single, my view of marriage, does it accurately paint the picture of Jesus in his relationship to the church? That's the application focus we're looking at this morning. The first application focus I want to look at is is what Paul starts with. It's it's that of the Christ-honoring submission of the wife. The Christ-honoring submission of the wife. Now, I I decided to frame my kind of examination of this in something I'm going to call the knots of submission, pun decidedly intended. The knots of of submission, because submission is a naughty problem, K-N-O-T-T-Y. It's a naughty problem, and it needs unraveling if we're to benefit from it. But I also framed all these phrases in terms of what submission is not. Now, I'm going to mostly read these because I wanted to go through this carefully. And if you would like these later, um, I'm glad to send them to you. So if you're writing frantically, but let me just walk through a number of knots of submission to examine what does it mean when Paul says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And let me remind you again that the glory of this is not in some cultural view of marriage. The glory of this is that the picture we paint with our marriages proclaims the relationship between Jesus and the church. That's the the glory of this. That's the glory of this opportunity that husbands and wives have or singles have as they just think about marriage or talk about marriage. That's the, the glorious motive that drives us in to consider what does Paul mean when he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So so let's walk through just some clarifying application knots about submission. First of all, a husband is not Christ, and a wife is never called to sin against the Lord in submission to her husband. This is a picture. This is not the reality. As I said last week, a wife doesn't worship a husband in the same way we don't dive into a picture of the ocean. It's a picture. It's not the reality. It's important that it reflects the reality, but it's not the reality. A wife is never called to sin against the Lord in submission to her husband. This ultimate allegiance to Christ, I believe, also includes the right of the wife to call governmental authorities in cases of physical abuse or danger caused by an evil husband. Submission to this kind of abuse is not in view when Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. First not. Second knot, a wife does not relate to Christ through her husband. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, which means that our identity in Christ and our access to God through Christ is not based on any other person. This means that the wife is responsible for her own spiritual maturity and for her own obedience and disobedience before the Lord. Her husband's headship, whether godly or ungodly, is not an excuse for a lack of personal godliness. He is there to lead her, not to replace her willing growth in Christ Jesus. The point could also be made in her 
that in a Christian marriage, a wife is called to do many things because of her union with Christ that are not antithetical to submission. She should love her husband by speaking to truth to him. She should exhort her husband towards godliness, just as she should forgive her husband and show mercy to him, all fulfillments of her new identity in Christ. Her submission is a function of her identity in Christ. Her, view, her, her relationship to Christ is not a function of her submission. Important to get the order correct. Third knot, a wife's submission is not mindless helplessness. Whatever the culture may say, that is not what is in view in a Christian view of marriage. A submissive wife should use her wisdom and her intelligence to cultivate godly leadership in her husband, to influence him toward godly leadership of their home, to fulfill her other roles, either in work production or parenting or in the church or in the community, in God-glorifying fashion. God has given women all kinds of opportunities in the community and in the church and in, in broader culture to influence for good and to express godly attributes. And submission in the home is is not some sort of declaration that that she's just helplessly dependent on her husband to make godly decisions and to live a, a productive, fruitful life. It's not mindless helplessness. Fourth not, submission is not a cultural option. It's a popular danger among modern liberal theologians to claim that roles within marriage, as well as other things stated in the New Testament, is a cultural construct of Paul's own mind. And they seek to dismiss it as archaic in the present age. But this is to risk eradicating the nature of the gospel itself. Paul does not tie these roles to cultural norms. He ties them to the relationship of Christ and the church, which does not change from one culture to the next. Fifth knot, a wife's submission is not subtle or emotional control. (laughs) Might be obvious, but it's worth stating. A wife's submission is not subtle or emotional control. In our culture, uh, if the culture isn't raging against the idea of a complementary view of roles, the next thing it might do is to claim, well, we all know who really has the control in the home. So there's a sort of a nominal headship with an underlying control that's endorsed. We know who wears the pants in this family. Other similar phrases are used, right? Submission is not subtle or emotional control. The woman might be tempted to think in our culture that at the end of the day, she is actually leading, or perhaps she might utilize manipulation or mockery or complaints to force the husband finally to follow her lead in the decision-making of the home. It is worth a Christian woman asking the questions, has my husband's leadership been reduced to the simple goal of trying not to upset me? Am I making it easy for him to make decisions in the normal flow of life, encouraging him to take initiative and make choices related to our life and family? Am I willing to give up preferences and desires for the sake of submitting to his leadership? Now, of course, the more important decisions, the stronger a woman's counsel and influence and input should be. But it is worth asking whether at the end of the day, A woman's subtle control is actually leading rather than encouraging her husband to lead. The difference between offering wisdom and counsel and preference and ultimately making the decision is a crucial distinction for every marriage to make. Sixth knot, wife's role in submission is not more God-honoring than singlehood. I thought there's an important caveat, you could say, to this passage, this passage emphasizing the husband and wife role. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 7 that marriage is a gift, singleness is a gift. What he means by that is each has an opportunity from the Lord to honor him and bring him glory. So we don't want to talk about marriage in the church in such a way that it makes it sound as though a woman is incomplete unless she is married. A man is incomplete if he is unmarried, if God gives a permanent gift of singleness. That is not the case. Man and woman are made in the image of God. Now, if they are called to be married, they do complement and create a, a wholeness together together. 
But that is not the same thing as saying that a single is half a person or that God can't bring amazingly fruitful godliness out of a single's life. We need to look no further than the singleness of our Lord for that example. Jesus was not half a human because he didn't have a wife. Important to clarify, make sure you point that out. All right, seventh knot. A wife's submission is not fulfilled identically in all marriages. Look back there at the passage. I just want to point something out. Notice that it says, wives submit to your own husbands. Now, of course, that protects women from the idea they should submit to every random guy uh, that wanders around. No, that's not the case. But I think it also states that there is a particularity of submission in a, in a given marriage. It's, it's going to be affected by a person's strengths and weaknesses, who this husband is and who this wife is. There's a, there's a uniqueness. Not all marriages are going to function precisely in the same way. Paul does not paint here a list of precisely what submission looks like practically because the very point is that submission is directed towards the headship of a particular husband. This should caution the church against having a very detailed view of what a perfect week looks like for every wife because every wife is not called to be married to the same man, praise the Lord, but to different men and to submit to each one will have its own subtle variations. In one marriage, the man might take time to cook. In another, the wife takes this responsibility. In one marriage, the man personally manages the home accounting. In another, he delegates this responsibility to his wife. In one home, the woman contributes to the income of the home. In another, she she does not. In one home, the wife dedicates much time to the schooling of her own children. In another home, the children are at a school and she uses that time in another beneficial fashion. Certainly, a woman with children is called to devote herself significantly to their spiritual and practical care. And all women should receive the admonition of Paul in 2 Timothy that they be busy at home and should strive after the model of Proverbs 31 that should be energetic in using her time for the well-being of her family. But the precise details of this calling will vary from one woman to the next. Now, hear, hear what I'm, I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to guard our church, to guard us from an overly rigid and ultimately a self-righteous view of precisely what submission looks like from one marriage to the next. There is an allowable variation here that we need to be cautious to uphold and encourage as we discuss what lives are like from one marriage to now? Certainly, there is a similarity. This is not wide variation. All wives are called to submit in this way. Certainly, there's going to be many ways that it is similar, but there's other ways that it is not. This, I think, also could caution women against the danger of comparison and envy, either of another woman's gifts or strengths or her particular opportunities in context. If I may make a point about mommy blogs, as they're called, um, they are certainly useful. If you've never read a mommy blog, um, that's probably because you're not a, I don't know why you would have one, but apparently they're out there. I don't read them, but they are there, okay? Uh, mommy blogs, they're useful in their own way, but they should result in mutual joy and the celebration of distinctive gifts, not in envy that I can't fulfill the greatest aspects of every woman's gifting. <laughs> I also would caution you, ladies, against a culture that says it devalues you if you direct the use of your talents and gifts under the authority of another person, especially your husband. It's worth remembering that the culture is the mouthpiece of the devil whose design is not your good and independence, but rather your slavery and the maligning of God's name. Of course, your husband does not create your value. Christ does. And since Christ does, it is the privilege and joy of a Christian woman to use her gifts and talents and time in submission to his word and painting a picture toward her husband of the church's view of Christ. Eighth knot of submission. A wife's submission is not partial or conditional. Notice down there in your passage, I Realize this is a challenging word to read, but this is scripture. We need to follow and receive from it. The church submits to Christ, so also wives, verse 24, should submit in everything to their husbands. This submission is not partial or conditional. 
The fact is that a woman, a Christian woman, is called to function toward her husband as head without leaving a certain aspect or part, portion or part of life to the side that rejects or refuses or determines that she will not listen or respond to his leadership in any way. Now, again, the caveat, a wife is never called to sin against the Lord in submission to her husband. But sinning against the Lord is different than submitting to a husband whose motives are at least partially suspect. Let me say that again. Sinning against the Lord is different than submitting to a husband whose motives are at least partially suspect. I, I have talked to ladies, I, I know any, any woman, certainly my wife and any woman, is going to have moments where the husband is leading in a way and she suspects that this decision is not entirely godly or it might be wholly ungodly, this particular desire designed for the home. But it does not call her to sin against the Lord or to submit to some kind of abuse. It, it simply is something that is more driven by his preference or desire and not something that causes her to sin in any way. So it may be inconvenient or burdensome. It's important that you fully receive this word in everything. Actually, Peter makes this point emphatic in chapter 3 of his epistle when he says that wives, even that are married to an ungodly or unsaved husband, can still honor the Lord by entrusting themselves to the Lord as they honor the role of their unsaved husband. Incredibly challenging but glorious verse because the context is the way that Jesus surrendered himself to the difficulty of the cross for the sake of saving his people. Again, no license to sin is in view here. When we think of all the practical direction, initiation, decision-making of a marriage, there are many ways that a wife can demonstrate to even a non-Christian husband that he is still the authority in the home. Her priority must be her own call to fulfill this biblical mandate though certainly she should graciously, graciously and firmly bring observations to her husband if she has concerns for his soul before the Lord. Ninth knot of submission. The wife's submission is not ultimately about her husband. Notice, again, the focus, the locus of this passage. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And this just flows out of the first half of Ephesians, which says we have been saved, we've been reconciled to God, we've been set apart for a life that displays the glory of the gospel. We're to live, he says, worthy of the calling to which we have been received in Christ, that he has claimed for us, that he has guaranteed for us by the, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And for every Christian woman... And all Christian women have to follow this passage towards imperfect and unchristlike men in some regard, or in some cases significantly. Their motive and their hunger and their longing has to be to glory and honor the name of Jesus Christ. To exalt him and see his name exalted in the way that she relates to her husband imperfect as he certainly is. That has to be the motive because certainly her husband is not going to be a sufficient motive to obey this passage. There is no husband sufficiently godly to motivate any woman to submit to his authority in the home. There, is no, there has never been a husband that was sufficiently godly or attractive or motivating in any way to fulfill a sustaining obedience to this passage. The only motive could be that when they look at the word and name Christ in this passage, it fills them with a hunger and a thirst to glorify him in this particular role and design of God. Therefore, for spiritual motivation, wives, I would encourage you to study much on the glory of Jesus Christ. 
Meditate on him. Marinate in his glory. Consider the privilege that you have. And let me just say this in distinction because I, I think this is the case. Husbands have to fight their own flesh in obeying the sacrificial love called for in this passage. Wives have to fight both their own flesh and the cultural outcry of the world in opposition to God. So it should, it should produce sympathy in the heart of every husband to realize, look, a wife not only has to fight her own flesh, which we do, because we're all selfish, she also has to fight the cultural declaration that any kind of complementarity of roles in God's design is oppressive and archaic and outrageous. She has to fight against that to see value. The culture at some level still values sacrificial love. The culture does not value submission. So wives, let me say this in deferential awe and appreciation. God has called you to proclaim something even beyond that which the husbands have the opportunity to proclaim here. He's called you to proclaim that you are a countercultural woman whose identity is found outside of this world. There, there's very few men who receive cultural antagonism because they serve their wives and families at home. Every woman receives cultural antagonism that she is aware of as she seeks to submit to an imperfect husband. So let me encourage you and applaud you and, and acclaim what God has given you to do. You reveal heaven on earth because you choose to believe that your value is not found in an assessment of authority, but ultimately in the one who has all authority, the person of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's important to receive the warning as well as the encouragement. Submission intentionally withheld from an imperfect husband maligns the authority of a perfect Savior. Submission intentionally withheld from an imperfect husband maligns the authority of a perfect Savior. The Christ-honoring submission of a wife. Okay, section number two. The Christ-honoring love of a husband. As we studied last week, this passage uh, could be a gospel meditating passage in its own right, just studying the the love of Christ as he pours out himself for his bride and he gives himself for her for her ultimate good, the design that she would be pure and blameless and without spot and would be seen on that final day. And he nourishes and cherishes, cares for her as his own body, the kind of instinctive, comprehensive care. And this is the mandate for the Christian husband. This is what the Christian husband is called to do. This defines husbands in what they are called to do before the Lord Jesus Christ. Three categories to understand this. First of all, sacrificial to the point of death. There is no other way to understand what, what Paul says here, that Jesus gave himself up for her, and that is how we are to love our wives, than to say, our love is defined by sacrifice to the point of death. Now, certainly that's true, literally. When there is a sound in the middle of the night and you think there might be a danger somewhere in your home, it must be the man who sacrifices himself for the good of the family. Because that is his unique privilege and role, to lay down his life, literally, if need be to throw his body in the way of any danger, literally if need be. But I think for most of us, the application of this is, is not as once and done. It's much more every moment and every day. This is not occasional servanthood, brothers. This is not anniversary day servanthood or servanthood after she says she's about to go crazy because she hasn't had a break in a year and I better do something or it's going to get worse. 
This is not that kind of servanthood. This is not self-serving servanthood, looking for some kind of return of whatever variety. This is not punch-in-the-clock servanthood where we serve as long as we get our downtime or our sleep time or our TV time or our football time or our nacho time. This is not that kind of servanthood. This is servanthood every day, every moment, laying down our preferences and rights for the sake of loving her. That's what a Christian husband is called to do. Others, we must take this word to heart and consider the glory of Jesus Christ. He gave himself, himself up for her. He gave himself up for her. Brothers, to be a Christian man is to declare that to die is to live. To lose is to gain. To be less is to be more. To go the way of the cross is to seek the crown of glory. That is what it means to be a Christian, and in particular, a Christian husband. Now, what part of our life, brothers, have we held rather than give up? That's the application that Paul drives home here. What what are we holding rather than giving up? What are we clinging to rather than sacrificing? Now, let's just think about some categories. I just put this list together for my own life. When we get home from work, there's a moment I'd rather hold on to rather than give it up. When we get home from work, I, I, I am called in that moment to give up myself for her sake. When a child, if you have children, needs something in the middle of the night, am I saying it's always wrong for the husband to remain asleep and the wife to be... No, of course not. But it's worth asking the question, what categories do I hold as off-limits? Because Christ held nothing off-limits from the sacrifice of his wife. What about when she needs a gentle observation, but she doesn't want to hear it? That's a certain kind of sacrifice. What about when she needs a long conversation and I would like a short one? What about when she needs an advance plan and I'd prefer to make it up as we go? What about categories where she needs consistency and I'd prefer spontaneity? Or maybe she needs spontaneity and I'd prefer consistency. What about when she needs spiritual fellowship and I'd prefer a friendship memory? Or she needs a friendship memory and I'd prefer spiritual fellowship. What about when we're tired? What about when we're weary? What about when we'd rather talk about our day than hers? What about when she'd like to talk about our day and we don't want to anymore? What does it mean to give myself up for her. What does it mean in terms of providing? What does it mean in terms of protecting? What does it mean in terms of encouraging, wooing, guarding, seeking? I love the wisdom of God in this passage that husbands are directly commanded to love and only by implication called to exercise headship. Wives are directly called to submit and only indirectly called to receive their husband's love. So as I mentioned last week, (laughs) it's important to remember, again, that marriage is not primarily about having our needs met in a kind of mutual tit-for-tat situation. She needs love, he needs respect, and that's why God created marriage the way it is. That's not ultimately the purpose of marriage. Now, God also, in his kindness, gives us bonuses, but that's not why he put marriage together this way. It's to display Christ in the church. You, if you're a husband, you are a husband for the sake of the gospel. To demonstrate what it meant for Christ to give himself up for her. Sacrifice to the point of death. 
Second category, dedicated to her ultimate good. The passage describes how Jesus' goal for her was that he might be, she might be holy and without blemish. It has this kind of long-term perspective, viewing her as she will be, as she could be, spiritually presented in all the fulfillment of her calling. I find in our culture that, that men have a, a, a high view of women when they are married, and they, they desperately hope that, that women will stay that way. Christ has the opposite. He saw her in her worst condition and envisioned how she could become. It's dedicated to her ultimate good. Now, I think this, this section of, of Christ having this view of the church being, being without blemish and, 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 and presented to himself in splendor, obviously it has her spiritual condition in view, but I, I think it has a, a point to be made about what kind of sacrificial husband we are called to be. It reveals the difference between being a, a flattering enabler and a servant leader. It's possible to misapply the self-sacrifice section to mean we simply enable a woman to pursue selfishness. That's possibly. And there are husbands who would rather give in to fear than arrogance. Not all husbands, but some husbands would rather appease and accommodate and serve every woman desire and would never desire the, the, the wife to experience a, a, an exhortation or encouragement to develop and grow and change and mature in godliness and the expression of her gifts. There are some marriages where that's the case. A man will sometimes take a leadership decision that is unpopular in the home, even unpopular with his wife, because she is tempted in some direction, and he is convinced that this choice ultimately, in the long run, is for her good. He must be willing to sacrifice his temporary popularity, even with her, for the sake of her spiritual priorities. The point made here is that Jesus had in view her future of perfection. He has a sure vision for his bride in view, and will do anything he can to bring that about. I think Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, says this wonderfully. He says, within this Christian vision of marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It is to look at another person and get a glimpse of what God is creating and to say, I see who God is making you, and it excites me. I want to be a part of that. I want to partner with you and God in the journey you are taking to his throne. And when we get there, I will look at your magnificence and say, I always knew you could be like this. I got glimpses of it on earth, but now look at you. That should be the heart of the husband. So does sacrificial service mean you never disappoint your wife with the decision? that you genuinely believe is for her good, but that she doesn't currently desire. No. Certainly there are moments where there's the, that is the right thing to do. Let me just, a word of encouragement. If sacrificial service is the norm in a home, moments where leadership is difficult but necessary huh, will be much easier to receive. If Pride and selfishness and preferences being demanded by the husband is the norm. The moment when actually a difficult decision should be made that's unpopular, much more difficult to receive. Doesn't make it wrong, it just makes it much more difficult to receive. Husbands should desire to make it as easy as possible for their wives to obey the very difficult command of submission in this passage. Looking for opportunities to sacrifice preferences because they know eventually they will have to hold firm on convictions. Of course, most wives that I know would be thrilled for their husband to lead convictionally. Final Category here, it's comprehensive. The love of the husband for the wife 
that honors Christ is comprehensive to the point of personal instinct. It's comprehensive. That's the point here of saying that, that the two have become one. Christ is one with his church. And again, the whole thing is a model here. He says, look, he, he nourishes and he cherishes it because it's a member of his own body. He treats it the way we would treat a member of our body. I mentioned last week, we, we don't tend to delay care for our bodies. We don't say, well, I'm thirsty now, but I'll deal with it next week. Or I'm hungry now, but I'll deal with it tomorrow. Or I'm in pain now, but I'll deal with that next month. We don't, we don't do those kinds of things. We say, I need food right now. I need food. I need food right now. And I need something to drink right now. And I need you to get me something from Starbucks right now. And I need coffee now, right now. I need it now. I need to have it right now. And if we don't say that, it's only because we don't want to seem as demanding as we are inside. That is how Christ relates to his church. Her spiritual needs, her physical needs, her emotional needs are on his mind as surely as our spiritual, physical, emotional needs are on our mind. And that is how husbands are to care for their wives. This is why you can't punch in and punch out of being a husband. This is why you don't have certain hours. This is a 24-7, 365 job description. As surely as we care for ourselves every second of every day, we are in tune with and caring for the well-being of our wives. Because that is how the Lord Jesus cares about his church. I can make a point to single men and young men. If you're interested in romance at some point in your life, and maybe you aren't, and if you aren't, God will call you to a life of singleness, and that'd be fantastic. But if you are interested in romance, and many young men are, romance in the Bible is one with the pursuit of marriage. They are not two separate topics. They are one. And so if you want to experience romance with a young woman, you need to get really familiar with what the Bible says about the purpose of being a husband because they are one and the same. They are not two different pursuits. You can't separate them in Scripture, and you shouldn't separate them in life. So if you want to begin pursuing somebody with the hope that one day she might possibly become a wife and a bride, I would get really familiar with Ephesians 5 and start acting in that way in appropriate ways now so that you have the right view of what the romantic goal is so that I can represent the Lord Jesus Christ towards you. If I can make a recommendation to husbands, maybe a simple way of discerning, when is it, when is it that I'm, I'm holding on to my preference and when is it that I'm just being a leader? How do I know which is which? Very difficult for husbands. I, so I'm sacrificing my preference. I'm doing what she wants, and and then, but I'm supposed to be leading. So how do I how do I know what, what is which one is this one? Is this like the humble and give up, or is this like the lead and be bold moment? When in doubt, you just a simple recommendation: sacrificial with preferences, firm and patient with convictions and humble and courageous in all conversations. Sacrificial with preferences. Not a lot of convictions in view. Firm and patient in convictions. Humble and courageous in all decisions. Final category of application, the Christ-honoring design of marriage. I wanted to back away from the roles of husband and wife and just look at this as a church to conclude and simply say that this passage I mentioned last week is simply one of the most culturally offensive passages in the New Testament. And we should bear in mind that where the culture seeks to oppose the church, we in a particular way are called to stand on the authority of God's word and uphold our allegiance to the gospel. Every culture, every generation has points at which the culture is particularly opposed. 
and points at which the culture is currently indifferent. And this is a point at which the culture is particularly opposed and seeking to decry and declaim and denounce the authority of God. And so in particular, the church has to hold firm. Complementarianism, this idea that there's roles that God has given in marriage, not a devaluing of either, but a calling of a particular application, is a battleground for biblical authority. And it has been well demonstrated over and over that churches and denominations that do not hold to the biblical teaching of distinctive gender roles in marriage begin to gradually but consistently discard their view of biblical authority in broader, more foundational categories. As one author, Rachel Evans, who I do not recommend that you read, says, the Christian versions of the household codes were clearly progressive for their time, but does that mean they have the last word? That Christians in changing places and times cannot progress further? Sounds very reasonable. It is deadly to the authority of God's word. Because if we progress in this area, we are essentially saying that the relationship of Christ and church did not receive its final declaration in the scriptures. And once you say that, you render asunder the authority of God's word and the proclamation of the gospel. We should also note that in view of the march forward of the acceptance of transgenderism, and homosexuality, we should look to this passage, among many others, to remember that the idea of distinctive genders is good in God's design. Of course, we should be patient and gracious with anyone who experiences uh, a desire or identification different than what we see in this passage, and we should love them and care for them and help them while also holding firm to the truth that what God creates is good and should not be reversed or denounced or discarded. We should also absorb God's perspective that a complementary, comp complementary design is beautiful and not oppressive. Let me also say that complementarianism is a battleground of satanic attack. It's worth noting, other commentators have, have pointed this out, Satan approached Eve precisely because Adam received the command. It was his own way of both tempting Adam and Eve, but also saying, I will reverse, I want to do the opposite of what God's design was. He's like a little child. Whatever you say, he says no. Now, did he need Adam to fall as well? Of course he did. Why did he approach Eve? Simply to be ornery. Simply to say to God, you gave the command to Adam, he's supposed to pass it on to his wife. You know what? I'm coming to Eve first. I'm going to ignore Adam. It's worth noting that there is this orneriness about Satan where he intends to do, to reverse orders that God has put in place, to reverse designs that God has put in place, to tempt people, to throw aside any of God's good purposes. He does that in creation. He does that in sexuality. He does that in marriage. He's looking to get people to say, I don't like God's design. I prefer to do it my own way. He does that over and over and over again. And we as the church have to be aware of this. It's helpful to notice that Paul moves quickly from marriage, parenting, employment, the daily interactions we have in life, the roles God has given us that are difficult and challenging, immediately into, in chapter 6, the spiritual warfare that is the common daily occurrence of the Christian. We have to live in our identity in the gospel, not simply as some, some duty towards the Lord, but also out of necessity because we are under attack from the enemy and from the flesh and from the culture who's looking for any opportunity to undermine our trust in the Lord and our desire to live for the glory of his gospel. So whether you're a single or a, a married couple or you're a widow, widower, any season you can apply this truth to uphold in our hearts the value of God's good purposes, husband and wife portraying the gospel, 
the beauty of God's design of genders, equally in his image, but then having different roles that they fulfill to display what Jesus does towards his church and how the church relates to her Lord. And the good news about all this is every step we take in portraying the gospel in marriage or in thinking about marriage that way is just a reminder for our own souls that this is the gospel that saved us. This is how we are saved by Jesus coming to seek us out. That we now have a worshipful relationship towards him. That's the good news in this passage. And it's the good news for anyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus as their savior. Because you can believe in this Jesus and he comes to you not because you're worthy, not because you're beautiful, not because you're a a marvelous addition to his people, his bride. No, he comes to you in your need and your sinfulness, just like he came to me. And he says, come, you can be a part of my people. You can be a part of my bride and you can be united with me. And I'm gonna display my love every day and every moment until you arrive in heaven full of glory. If you're a Christian, this truth is just a reminder every day. Striving to reflect this picture reminds a Christian of the original and fills our heart with joy. Christ did give himself up for us. He will present us blameless. And if you have an imperfect marriage and you're struggling with sin and struggling with conviction because of failures in the past, receive the truth of the good news of this passage. You will be a part of that people that will be presented blameless and with perfection. You will not be the one blemish on the people of God that day because there will be no blemishes, no imperfect marriages will be left on that day. No failures of the past will be left on that day. No single people who didn't get the job done in their roles towards their marriage will be left on that day as a disappointment to the Savior. You will be included in the blameless and without wrinkle and with perfection. This means that every Christian, husband and wife, whatever their track record of marriage, will be presented as a perfect bride on that final day. It's good news. It's good news. Because our marriages need a lot of work. But there's a great bridegroom who's making sure that every part of his people is going to reach the masterpiece plan that he intended when he gave himself up for her. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you for the promise contained in this passage. Lord, thank you for that promise. Lord, I I want to pray specifically for husbands and wives and Lord, those that are just have experienced conviction or conflict in their marriage or difficulty trying to honor you, but finding it challenging. Lord, I pray that the, the comfort of this passage that you will present every part of your bride without blemish. There won't be a single Christian couple that's a blemish on that day. Not a single Christian marriage that will be be left out of your glorification process. We receive the hope of that, Lord. We've all got a long way to go, but we receive the hope and the assurance that comes. Lord, as we fight to obey, we are keeping our eyes fixed on that day, on the one who can get us there, finally wash away every stain, every failure. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving yourself up for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.